G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for another team focused video. I did Richmond the other day and I want to take another look at Melbourne. This is not the first Melbourne video I've made this offseason, but I do think they continually present as an interesting subplot in this year's offseason in terms of their list management moves. Um, I, the last video I did was exploring the possibility of them losing a bunch of players. In the end, they walk away with Petrarca, Oliver and Cozzy Pickett, the players that I talked about in that video all still on their list. I made the comment it was an interesting crossroads for them if those players moved on in terms of the way that they'll continue to transition their list. Now they sit at a very interesting point in the premiership window and I would still suggest they are still in the premiership window when you consider the top end talent but they are an aging list with a lot of players you know 29 or older next season and I will go through who those are. So naturally, they're a team still in the window, in my opinion, considering their best players, namely Gorn, Petrarca, Viney, and potentially Clayton Oliver if he returns to being a top line level footballer. I'd imagine they still see themselves as a team that should play deep into finals next year. One more bad season of finishing bottom five and it's probably over. But what I think is interesting about Melbourne is that instead of being a team that is continually topping up, they've made a couple of top up moves. You know, they traded for Jack Billings. I don't know if that really counts, but they have been aggressive at hitting the draft in recent years. So what we've got is this aging top end group that is still potentially in contention, but underneath that they have been quietly building a pretty interesting young core that they'll look to add to again in this year's draft with two top 10 picks. So I'm probably gonna do videos focusing on these teams that will have influence on this draft. Richmond is the most obvious example. I did that video already. Melbourne again have two top 10 picks after having six and 11, that became seven and 13 in last year's draft. Maybe we'll look at St Kilda next. Maybe we'll look at North Melbourne if they hold multiple selections in the top 10. But yeah, I guess in this video, I sort of want to uncover, you know, Melbourne's list build in particular. And there is obviously this belief out there with Tasmania around the corner that the teams that are in contention now and not accessing the draft will be the worst placed when that team comes in in 2028 and that's completely logical even if I suspect it might be a little bit overblown. I don't necessarily think there's going to be an absolute dearth of young talent when that team comes in. I mean my team was rebuilding in 2009 and 2010 and, and 2011 of course as well when, when Gold Coast GWS entered the competition took all the best young talents um, and maybe it's a fluke but West Coast 2010 draft which was heavily compromised in a year they won the wooden spoon they still walked away from the draft with four premiership players three of them being all Australians as well so anyway that's a side note I think we can generally accept that it makes sense for teams to try and invest in the draft now rather than wait until 2028. So the teams that will be on the downswing in 2028 will in theory be the most vulnerable because they won't have access to the top talents. So then you, you know, my mind goes through who are the best placed teams for when Tasmania come around the corner in terms of teams that have hit the draft. You think North, to some extent Richmond now, obviously with this draft getting them a whole heap of first round picks. I would still throw West Coast in there even if they traded down from pick three. By 2028, they will have had enough access to the draft. And probably the Gold Coast Suns as well through their academy, even the Brisbane Lions actually. So then you think who are the most vulnerable and you look at the teams that are in contention now and I broadly consider to Melbourne that even if this year didn't go to plan but then as I look at it I feel like they've made some interesting moves over the years to plan for this so let's get into what they've done first of all I'll start this the same way I started the Richmond video and just get up there best 23 so you still have a lot of good players in there and some quality young players as well in the back line you've got McV and Rivers as young talents and Salem Lever May they're still absolute jets you got Caleb Windsor and around some experience as well and Oliver Petrarca and Viney and Max Gorn this is still a very very good team Harrison Petty is picked as a forward there you got Tom, Tom Sparrow on the forward flank the interesting one to see how much they miss Neil Bullen he did have a pretty good season this year but generally speaking I still think that team is rock solid. Now let's have a look at how many players are gonna be 29 or older next season. Now this doesn't mean they're going to drop down the ladder again or you know miss finals miserably just because they got a lot of older players. It is, it, we're really thinking about a few years into the future. And Max Gorn, Jack Viney, Petrarca, May, Lever, Tom McDonald, Melksham, McAdam, Billings, Marty Hoare, Ed Langdon will all be 29 or older next season. Some of those players are undoubtedly more important than others, but that is a fair chunk of the list that will probably make way between now and Tasmania entering, entering the competition. And we also factor in the retirement of Angus Brayshaw. However, what places Melbourne in a pretty good position has been their ability to access the draft regardless. And, and part of this might have been a couple of years where they fell down the ladder unexpectedly. So it was it 2019, they went from a prelim to like bottom two, they ended up drafting Luke Jackson. He ended up getting, getting traded for what I think is essentially Matthew Jefferson in 2022 and Caleb Windsor in 2023. This is another year where they've fallen down the ladder and hold pick five as it currently stands, which likely becomes 
pick six on the night. So if we, if we look at it at like the young core of talent there at Melbourne, it's, this is 24 and under. You've got Jacob Van Royen, Cozzy Pickett, Colton Tholstrup, Thomas Barrow, Trent Rivers, Caleb Windsor, Harrison Petty, Judd McVie, and Blake Howes. All these guys are 24 and under at the time of right now, basically, not next season. Then you got some transition players like Bailey Fritch is 27, Clayton Oliver's 27. Who knows what's going to happen with Clayton Oliver? There's also Spargo, Bowie, and Cade Chandler. So my point being that I think I still think there's a rock solid under 24 group in there. I suppose if you look at it, what's it lacking? Probably top end midfield punch but they've got a good key back in Harrison Petty if they pre presumably I think Petty goes back once you know May and Lever move on just a bit of a hunch on that one but Van Royen as a key forward there's some list balance there they certainly don't have a replacement for Max Gorn but there are some very good players there Cosy Pickett Trent Rivers in particular still being 24 and under and if both have played 100 games now obviously there's the elephant in the room Cosy Pickett has a go home rumor every off season but for now we'll just assume he's part of the team so like I said I still think probably looking at top end midfield would be the go for the Melbourne Football Club. But to circle back to Clayton Oliver, this is an interesting one. In terms of age, he is right between this 24 and under group, but probably not quite in the older, about to transition out of the team group. Now, if he transitions out of the team, it's not because of his age. So this will be an interesting decision. And I suspect Melbourne probably were very open to trading Clayton Oliver this off season. Now this is a guess, but I'm gonna assume they probably wanted to get rid of him, at least explore that opportunity and see if they can get him for a decent market rate. But they wanted to be tactful about it. And I presume Clayton Oliver didn't know about it and probably wanted to see what they could get in terms of draft picks to try and add to this under 24 group, but being discreet about it enough to not lower his cost. Because as soon as a club is actively shopping a player, his value will drop through the roof. Although it was high, so presumably you could come down through the roof and still be low. I think best case scenario for Melbourne is Clayton the, you know, comes good again, but he is undeniably caught in between both age groups, in my opinion. But regardless, Melbourne are in a great position here to add to their young core that I talked about before. I do think it is quite strong, even if it probably doesn't have a role goal midfielder. And we'll talk about their philosophy as well, which I think is fairly interesting. But in recent drafts, they've taken a pick seven in Windsor, pick 13 in Tholstrup, 15 in Matthew Jefferson, who hasn't played a game yet, and I don't know where he's at, and a pick 19 on Van Royen. And Van Royen, I think, is a very good young prospect, and it's amazing that was the player that they drafted in a year where they won the premiership. But just as a side note, it's funny to think that I think if Melbourne take five and nine this year, they will have the same amount of top 10 draft picks as the West Coast Eagles over this same time frame. <laughs> West Coast do have a Harley Reid, which I'm very grateful for, but you know, Melbourne also went pretty hard for Harley Reid. So that leads me to this interesting trading philosophy and, and this list build philosophy, which I suspect is happening here in Melbourne. So there's a curious, very curious trade they did last year with the Gold Coast Suns, where they traded pick 14, 27, and 35 for simply pick 11. So to move up from 14 to 11, they added on 27 and 35. Gold Coast presumably used those uh, picks as points and Melbourne gave up you know, a reasonable selection in a decent draft last year to move up from 14 to 11 and eventually take Colton Tholstrup. So without picking that apart as to whether or not that was a good outcome for Melbourne, I think it was an odd one, but I suppose we'll see in time. It's this really aggressive strategy of trying to get pretty early in drafts. And this year they've done it again by trading a future first and a future second to get into the top 10 of this year's draft, pick nine, which was originally Essendon's. So it seems like they're doing everything in their power to cash in on top 10 selections, which is an aggressive strategy and certainly far less conservative than other clubs. You know, I support a team that is relatively conservative. There's a pretty reasonable history of data there to suggest that West Coast, for instance, is willing to trade back to get more selections when talent pools are even. Melbourne are the exact opposite example of that. They try to move up aggressively. Now, is that necessarily going to pay off? Obviously, we don't know yet, but they also have a bit of a history of just taking their guys. Both Caleb Windsor and Colton Tholstrup were players that I think, from memory, were drafted earlier than was necessarily forecasted. Not a criticism. I do really like Caleb Windsor. I think that was a great selection, but... Up until Melbourne were linked with him, he was considered more of a 10 to 15 range prospect. But anyway, we're just getting a feel for what, what their philosophy is. So I think when you look at the team that won Melbourne the, uh, the Premiership, obviously they're a great team and played a great system. But there was one off the back of a group of absolutely elite footballers surrounded by good quality role players. And, and that is the hallmark of many great teams. I did a video looking at AFL dynasties some time ago. And you can see a trend of, of them assembling a group of absolute star talents. You know, Geelong and Hawthorne also did this same thing and the talents around that filtered in and out but the main guys stayed there so leading on from that Melbourne's strategy appears to be getting picks as high as they can overpaying to some extent to get the guys that they think have massive upside 
who can be the next Petrarca, the next Luke Hodge, the next Gary Ablett Jr., I suppose. They're going for these top-end talents, evidenced by their aggressive move for Harley Reid last year. And then presumably can filter in the rest of the team with later picks. Now we can see often the best teams in the competition will be able to fill out their role players by using later picks and then prioritizing the top picks for the high upside guys. So I think it's an interesting philosophy and, and they're kind of doing something a little bit different to, to everyone else in the comp right now. That is giving up a little bit of value here and there to get really early selections. And of course it's risky, but every strategy is risky a little bit. It's also risky to trade back and get more selections you'd think. But this is particularly aggressive what they're doing. And further than that, they are a little bit of an outlier in terms of teams with the age profile of a contending team that are going hard at the draft. And, you know, part of having an early pick this year was finishing low. But there is a bit of a history of trading those picks, trading up. And it feels like they definitely have one eye on a few years when Tasmania comes in and someone like a Collingwood who, you know, went aggressively for Dan Houston. In theory, Melbourne feel that they'll be better placed. So how does all of this, what I've said, inform us about how they might take their picks in this year's draft? So naturally you think they might just go best available talent. Those are good picks. They're probably going to get good players. Yeah, probably. But I can also see them being swayed by high upside types. At their first selection, at this current point in time, like if they're looking for a midfielder, which I think they, they should. If you look at that young core that I highlighted there, Trent Rivers is kind of a midfielder. He spent 30% of time at center bounces last year. Caleb Windsor is kind of a wingman. He could become a genuine on-baller. You'd still think they need to add to that. So they'll still be in that first group of picks where the top level of genuine midfielders, when I say genuine midfielders, they're not primarily another position who's transitioned into playing midfield. Talking about genuine midfielders, um, they should have, as it currently stands, their pick of one of Harvey Langford or Josh Smiley. Now, is there a chance that Jagger Smith gets to pick five or what will become pick six on the night? I said this in the Richmond video, and I know this is crazy, but hear me out. I'm not predicting this, but just saying, it could be possible. If the order goes Sam Lawler to Richmond, Finn O'Sullivan to Richmond, and Carlton take Draper, which has been Adelaide's reported pick or presumed pick for some time. Do Adelaide then go with Jagger Smith? Because I could see Adelaide then going for a point of difference. If the homegrown talent is not on the board anymore, do they go for a Harvey Langford or something like that? Of course, this falls apart if Richmond take him at pick two. And that's even if Richmond hold pick two, because at the moment it is technically North's pick. We just expect that there's probably going to be a trade there, but we don't know for sure. But if North hold pick two, do they go tall? That seems to be their need. Do they... Take someone like an Alex Toru, probably unlikely, but possible. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked and excited by all these different permutations. Where I was getting at is, is they'll probably be attracted to the high upside types, but they do have two selections. So with their first pick, do they go the conservative option? Pray for a Jagger Smith, which would be a great result, or a Langford or a Smiley. Or will they be swayed by the real high upside types? Now, in my last mock draft, I had Melbourne taking Toru with pick six. And I, I kind of like it because it's ballsy. And I do think that Melbourne, in theory, would be attracted to the upside, even if it's not a massive need. But let's park that. Alex Toru is one of a number of players with massive upside that Melbourne could reach for early. And they'll probably have to accept that someone like Toru, if they want him, probably won't be there at their second pick. But some other really high upside types are someone like a, a Bo Allen. Now he's a massively athletic prospect that has shown some proficiency in the midfield. He's a good contested player, but a really high upside athletic type off halfback as well. He's a lot more explosive and free running on the outside, but when he plays in the midfield, he is a contested ball. By sheer virtue of the fact that he's a high upside type, I feel like Melbourne could be attracted with at least one of their picks. Alex Toro is another one, maybe at their second selection if he's available, maybe they're conservative with their first one, take the best available midfielder, and then go for the high upside type with the second pick. Someone like Taj Hotner as well, I think, falls under the category of being high upside, high risk, that again, Melbourne could look at. So again, this comes back to my presumption that Melbourne's philosophy here is absolutely try and get star talent with these top end selections. They could go conservative with both picks, but I suppose that's what you have to let me know, particularly if you're a Melbourne fan. What do you expect Melbourne to do with these two picks? Is it even a safe assumption they go two midfielders? I don't know if it is safe. If they love the upside of Alex Toru, I reckon they'll have to take him at their first pick. I probably wouldn't predict it at this point, even though I put it in my mock draft. It is still quite a bold claim. I think that will be a very interesting team to watch. And generally speaking, I've been very interested in their rebuild and their list philosophy. So, but anyway, guys, let me know in the comments what you think about anything I've said here. I think Melbourne's the list management case study there is quite interesting and that is why I've done a second video on them. But of course, let me know anything you agree with or disagree with. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.